Dr. Craig, the title of this essay in the blog is God Created the Universe from Nothing, or Did He? It's from Bob Seidensticker of the Cross Examined blog. We've uh, interacted with Bob on several occasions. He always writes about interesting things and is a good writer. Uh, you've written on this topic with Paul Copan. Yes, Paul and I published a book several years ago called Creation Out of Nothing uh, with Baker. And uh, in it, uh, Paul has four chapters that are dedicated to a detailed exegesis of the Old and New Testament passages concerning creatio ex nihilo, uh, and then an examination of Jewish sources uh, outside the Bible, as well as the early church fathers. So what we have um, here from Bob in just two typewritten pages uh, is more fully unfolded by Paul in these chapters in our book, Creation Out of Nothing. Bob sets the case out by saying at the beginning, uh, the Christian idea of creation ex nihilo, mm -hmm. that God created the universe from nothing, is a doctrine within many denominations. The problem appears when Christians try to find it in the Genesis six-day creation story. It's not there. Like so many confidently stated doctrines, the Bible doesn't cooperate. Letting the Bible speak for itself exposes the unsupported claims. Now, let it be said right away that the doctrine of creation out of nothing doesn't rest upon just one Bible verse, like Genesis 1.1. It rests upon the testimony of the entirety of Scripture, Old and New Testament. And I think when you consider Scripture in its entirety, it does teach creation out of nothing, um, and I do think that it's implied in Genesis 1-1, as well as we'll see as we talk about Bob's blog. Okay. He begins, in the beginning, the first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1 from the NIV. It doesn't say that God created out of nothing, and only the lack of specified uh, materials that God worked with supports creation ex nihilo. Yeah, I think that's understating the case that um, creation out of nothing is implied or implicit uh, in this verse. Uh, the very expression, in the beginning, uh, suggests an absolute beginning. Uh, only God exists. There isn't anything else. Um, there's no warring monsters. There's no chaos to be subdued. There is just God. In the beginning, God. And then God created, uh, the Hebrew word is bara. This is a word which only God is the subject of this verb, and it does not presuppose a material substratum. It, it can have a material uh, substratum, but it, bara can be used uh, without a material substratum to in indicate a sort of absolute creation. And then the expression, the heavens and the earth, is a totalizing phrase that is composed of opposites, the heavens above, the earth beneath, so that this is meant to encompass the entire universe. And in fact, in the beginning, God created the universe. And I think it would have been unthinkable to the Hebrew author of Genesis that alongside God was some sort of uncreated primordial matter, mm -hmm. which he merely formed into a universe. For the Hebrew author, God is the absolute sovereign over uh, all reality that exists apart from himself. He is the creator of the entire universe, of the whole material realm, and the idea that there could have been some uncreated stuff existing co-eternally with God would have been, I think, unthinkable to the Hebrew author. He continues, and he brings up the word Hebrew word bara. Yes. He says, look more closely at the word created, the Hebrew word bara. This word is used 55 times in the Old Testament. Most instances are translated as create, but not all, and few could be read as create from nothing. For example, it's make a signpost in Ezekiel 21, 19, and create in me a pure heart in Psalm 51, 10, which are obviously talking about forming out of existing material. The NET Bible agrees. The verb does not necessarily describe creation out of nothing. It often stresses forming a new, reforming, or renewing. 
Right. The argument is not from the sheer meaning of the word. Uh, you can derive creation out of nothing any more than you could from the English word create. Um, they have a range of meanings, and it will be determined by the context. And the context here, as I say, is God's creation of the whole of physical reality, everything that exists apart from himself. He says, early church fathers like Justin Martyr and Origen also held that the Genesis creation was from something. I'd have to verify that. I'm, I'm skeptical of that. I know in his chapter on the church fathers, uh, Paul Copan uh, lists extensively the teaching of the church fathers with respect to creation out of nothing and finds that again and again they, they affirm the doctrine. Okay. Bob continues, one intriguing hypothesis is that the verse should read, in the beginning God separated the heavens and the earth. Since the universe in Genesis 1 is built with separations, light is separated from darkness in verse 1 through 4, uh, verse 1 through 4. Water above is separated from water below, 1 verse 7. And land is separated from water in verse 9. I'm not aware of any commentator who would translate bara as God separated the heavens and the earth. Uh, the actions of separation, as he points out, come after the creation of the heavens and earth, in which God separates light from darkness, the waters above from the waters below. Um, but that would simply be a mistranslation of the opening verse to translate that as separated. There, there is no separation here of heavens and earth. It's the creation of the heavens and the earth. Okay. He continues, you can respond that this is educated guesswork and that create... <laughs> or uneducated guesswork. <laughs> <laughs> that create might still be the best word, but it still doesn't say create from nothing. And of course, centuries separate the original Genesis from our best copies, and it was oral history before that, so it's also guesswork what the original said. Which is irrelevant because it is the received scripture that Christians take to be authoritative and inspired by God. And so the question is, what does the text of Genesis read as we have it? And as it stands, um, it, it says, created. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next story in Genesis, the centuries older Garden of Eden story, also has God creating, but here he creates using something else. For example, Eve was created from Adam's rib and Adam was created from dust. Now, often the story in Genesis 2 of the creation of mankind is represented as an alternative creation story to chapter 1. But I think that that's quite mistaken. When you look at ancient Near Eastern myths, you will find that in addition to cosmogonies, that is to say, stories about the origin of the world, of the universe, there are also stories about how the gods create humanity. And that's what you have in chapter 2. This isn't an alternative creation account. This is an account about the creation of mankind. Uh, and in their case, um, they're not created ex nihilo, but out of the dust of the earth. So what you have in chapter 1 is a sort of panoramic view of all of creation with mankind created on the sixth day. And then in Genesis 2, the focus narrows in on that sixth day and gives a detailed account of the creation of humankind um, on this earth. Okay. Bob continues, and he calls this section, God did use existing matter, water. Let's continue the Genesis 1 creation story, he writes, with verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The deep is the ocean, and the metaphorically relevant aspect here is the ocean as chaos. The six-day creation story shows God creating order from chaos. Now, it is certainly true that a great number of, I think, careless commentators have described this initial state as chaos. But that is um, a great misunderstanding, both of the text of Genesis and of the word chaos. 
chaos is a lawless state, totally without order, in which anything can happen. And you have this kind of chaos featured, for example, in certain Egyptian creation myths, uh, where the world emerges from chaos, um, or in certain Greek myths that will use the word chaos. But the state that's described uh, on the primitive earth in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 is not a chaos. Um, rather, it is simply a primeval ocean cloaked in darkness. Um, unlike the Egyptian myths, this ocean is not un unbounded, but rather it exists on the earth. It covers the land which will eventually emerge from it, and it has a surface over which the wind is blowing. It is not characterless or, or lawless, but rather it's the same water that will eventually fill the seas in which marine life will thrive and which will fall from the sky as rain. It is not unordered or chaotic. It has the properties of water with which ancient Israelites would have been familiar, like liquidity, weight, surface tension, buoyancy, uh, solvency, potability, and so forth. The primeval ocean is no more a chaos in the proper sense of that term than is a ravaged landscape, which is also described in the Old Testament uh, by this same phrase, without form and void, uh, in Jeremiah 4, 23. Namely, this is an uninhabitable waste, is what this means. So an ancient Israelite reading Genesis 1-2 would probably have pictured the state of the early earth to be like a pitch black night out on the Mediterranean Sea when no moon and stars were visible. And this would have been a condition that um, Israelite sailors themselves would have experienced in their um, sailing or voyages on the Mediterranean Sea and in the Persian Gulf. This state of affairs is completely unlike the amorphous, uh, chaotic um, sort of condition described in Egyptian myths. And so I think it's uh, a real misrepresentation and misunderstanding of Genesis to describe this initial state as chaos. Okay. He continues talking about the water here. He said the, this water wasn't made by God, but was material that he worked with. Well, now why does he say that? Verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the big picture. And then verse 2 focuses in on the earth. And the earth mm -hmm. was formless and empty, and, uh, and the water was upon the, or darkness was upon the face of the deep. Mm -hmm. So it, it describes the condition of the earth after God has created the heavens and the earth in verse 1, and the condition of the early earth was this primeval ocean covering the land. Okay. Uh, he says he separated the water into two parts, the sky held up by a vault, and the ocean. This, again, I think is a very common misunderstanding. The Hebrew word there is rakia, and some people have said that the ancients interpreted this to be like a hard dome, sort of like an inverted bowl over the earth. Um, and descriptions of the, uh, the, the this so-called dome um, in ancient Babylonian astronomical texts will describe it as made out of precious stone, like lapis lazuli and other uh, precious stones. But what these biblical interpreters fail to understand is that these are literary metaphors. It's not that the ancient Babylonians thought that there were literally these stone shells around the earth grinding against each other and scraping each other. This is evident in the fact that the different heavenly bodies, like the sun, the moon, the stars, were placed in different um, spheres, so to speak, of, mm -hmm. of the sky, um, and therefore they would be invisible if, if these were hard surfaces made out of stone. You couldn't see through them to see the upper layer. You couldn't see the stars. But here's the decisive consideration that I 
discovered. In reading the ancient Babylonian astronomical texts, and, and just by the way, Kevin, observational astronomy was invented by these ancient Babylonians. These Babylonian astrologers and astronomers were uh, masters of observation and kept detailed, meticulous records of solar motions, uh, of eclipses, rising and setting of the stars, and so forth. And these have been all, pre well, not all, these have been preserved in cuneiform tablets so that we can read these Babylonian astronomical texts today. And what you discover is that they characterize different paths in the sky that would be followed by different stars as you watch them over time. They move at different rates. And then, of course, the planets wander with respect to the fixed stars. So what you've got is these three paths of Anu and Leel and Ea. Those are the three gods and their three paths followed by these stars through the night sky. And these are described, as I say, using these metaphors of these hard lapis lazuli shells and shells of other precious stones. But that this is merely a metaphor is evident from the fact that the planets wander across these paths and the moon and the sun move across these paths, which would be impossible if they thought that these heavenly bodies were stuck in this firmament. And as the, the shell grinds around, <laughs> the stars move around, mm -hmm. that would be impossible. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that this is a metaphor for the heavens they're observing, and they thought that the stars, or rather, they thought that the planets, the sun, the moon, were in motion across the paths of Anu and Leel and, and Ea. And similarly, when you get to Genesis, there's no indication in Genesis that they thought that this was some kind of a hard shell um, in which the stars were and the sun and moon were embedded. Um, if this was in line with ancient Babylonian thought, this would have just been a metaphor to speak of the, the expanse of the sky in which God places the sun, moon, and stars. I'm so glad you cleared that up because I, I run into that all the time. It's uh, very common. It, you know, saying, hey, you know, uh, read your Bible lately? It says a big dome is out there and, uh, you know, and really, really throw this whole and thing And that out. is not true, and it is not true that the ancient Babylonians believed in such a rigid shell or hard dome around the earth either. Okay. Well, he goes on the second page then to says that uh, the New Testament agrees, and he quotes Second Peter, Bill, uh, by God's word the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And Second clearly Peter 3, he's reflecting, this author is reflecting back on Genesis 1-2 where it says, that God said, let the dry land appear, and the, the earth came out of this primordial ocean as the hills and mountains rose, and the ocean drained into the seas and the lakes and the river. But where the New Testament does, I think, clearly uh, imply creatio ex nihilo would be a passage like John 1, 3. In the beginning was the Word. He's imitating the language of Genesis 1, 1 mm -hmm. in John one one in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god and then verse 3 all things were made through him and without him not one thing uh, was made that was made uh, he is saying there that everything other than god and the word in the beginning came into being through the word and without the word, not one thing came into being. That implies creatio ex nihilo. Okay. Bob then go, goes to combat myth. He says, if you're a regular reader of this blog, you may have already noticed hints of the combat myth, also known as, and go ahead and, and give it a That's German for struggle against chaos. This is a common story structure that appears in the mythology of many cultures, some of the cultures in the ancient Near East with this myth are oldest to youngest, Akkadia, Babylonian, Ugarit, and Israel. 
The details were unique to each culture, but the outline is largely the same. Now, this is so much fun for me, Kevin, that you've chosen this podcast because this is what I've been studying lately as I've been exploring the historical Adam. I've been reading these ancient Akkadian and Sumerian and Egyptian creation myths and cosmogonies, theogonies, and so forth. And uh, so I, I know what's going on here. And what's striking about Genesis 1 is the absolute absence of any chaos kampf, any struggle or fight or battle against primordial monsters or other gods or forces resisting God. The, the remarkable thing that every commentator on Genesis remarks on is the ease and effortlessness with which God creates these things. He, he gives his almighty command and it comes to pass and is so. There is no trace whatsoever of this these myths of battling dragons or gods or war against chaos or things of that sort. Okay. Bob tries to make the case that here he says, first, there's a threat to the status quo. The threat isn't evil, it's chaos. The council of the gods argues about what to do and none of the older generation of gods steps up to fight the chaos monster. A younger god, unimportant to this point, volunteers. After a fierce battle, this god defeats chaos, orders restored, and he takes his place as the chief god. The human world is formed from the body of the slain chaos monster. And it hardly needs comment that Genesis is utterly unlike this pattern. Don't you think Genesis is so superior? Yeah. This, this yeah. is the thing that just stuns me, Kevin. I, when you read these ancient creation myths... I am shocked, I'm stunned that Israel could have had such an elevated um, mm. and philosophically sophisticated concept of God as this transcendent creator beyond the universe that mm. speaks it into being and, and is the creator of all these other things that exist. Mm. This is so unlike the creation myths of Israel's neighbors, it's, it's just stunning to think that an ancient people could have come up with something like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't you read in the Epic of Gilgamesh that the gods had these dog heads and they were afraid of the flood and they hid? And well, the... it says they were cowering like dogs cowering uh, like against dogs. the wall when the flood yeah. occurred. And then after the flood is over and the uh, person who survives the flood offers sacrifice, says the gods swarmed around the sacrifice like flies. Mm. I mean, it's yeah. a very, yeah. as you say, crude and primitive conception of God that you have in these uh, polytheistic Mesopotamian myths. They, yeah. they're, they're vile, they're primitive, they're crude. It's so utterly mm -hmm. different than this philosophically sophisticated notion of God that you have in ancient Israel. Yeah, and I was trying to remember what the dogs were. It was uh, They were cowering like dogs. Yes, that's right. You got it right. <clears throat> um, he says, for example, the Arcadian myth has Anlil as the king of the gods. Anzu steals the symbol of kingship, creating chaos. Nunurta steps up to fight Anzu. A clever trick allows Ninurta to defeat Anzu, and he becomes the new king. Elements of the Genesis story are a little easier to see in the Babylonian version of the combat myth documented in their creation myth, the Enuma Elis. Am I saying Elish. that right? Elish, uh, usually that. transliterated with an H on the end, Enuma Elish. The <clears throat> documented in their creation myth, the Enuma Elish. Tiamat, the female dragon who represented salt water, and Absu, the male freshwater god, were the first gods, and their children formed the younger generation of gods. And then he says, Absu eventually grew annoyed with his noisy children and planned on killing them, but they discovered his plan and killed him first. His consort, Tiamat, was furious and planned revenge. Marduk, the storm god, responded to the threat, and he killed Tiamat, making him king of the gods. He formed our world from the body of Tiamat, splitting it 
and making the heavens from one half and the earth from the other half. And we're supposed to see Genesis in this Babylonian myth. <laughs> Note the similarities. He says that Yahweh and Marduk were both storm gods. And I think that's false on both accounts. Neither of them were storm gods. Each fought and defeated a threat by chaos, the sea monster. We've seen that in Genesis. That's not the case. There is no fight against chaos, and the primordial ocean is just an ocean, just mm -hmm. water. It, it's not a chaos. It's not a monster. For Marduk, it was Tiamat. For Yahweh, it was Leviathan, also known as Rahab. Neither of which is mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. Job 41 is an entire chapter devoted to its description. Double coat of armor, fearsome teeth, its back has rows of shields, flames stream from its mouth. Here in Job you have a poetic description of either a mythological monster or else, as many commentators think, of a crocodile. Um, but it's irrelevant to Genesis chapter 1, which includes no such description or battle. The Babylonian story begins with the gods of salt water and of fresh water. Water is also essential in the Genesis story, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Yeah, a very different uh, presentation where uh, the world at first was this primordial ocean, and then God um, forms the dry land to, out, out of that ocean. It's uh, only tangentially similar to other creation stories that involve water. He indicates the next similarity is Marduk creates the heavens and the earth from two halves of Tiamat's body. Yahweh separates the water into two parts, the sky and the earth. Oh, now that, that's not right. And, and this is important to see. In the Babylonian Enuma Elish, um, Marduk f flays open Tiamat's body like a clamshell, and one half is used to uh, create the heavens, uh, and on the other half, uh, you have the earth below. But in Genesis, Yahweh is not creating the heavens and the earth. He's simply dividing the waters into the waters above, which would be the rain, the clouds that fall from the sky, and then the waters below, which eventually drain into the seas, the lakes, the rivers, and so forth. It's not a separation of heavens and earth or creation of heavens and earth. That's already been done in verse 1. It's simply a separation of these primordial waters. Okay. He says another connection is linguistic. The word Tiamat is a linguistic cognate with the Hebrew Tehom, the deep. Now that's uh, misleading. Akkadian and Hebrew are both Semitic languages. Um, Akkadian is a dead language that was spoken by ancient Babylon. And being a Semitic language, Hebrew and Akkadian are related to each other. But the word tehom, deep, indicating the ocean in Genesis, isn't derived from the word tiamat. They are not genealogically related in that way, that is a point that has been conclusively established by modern linguists. Rather, these are two different words that both go back to a common root um, word in uh, um, a Semitic language, but they are, are not derived one from another. Okay. He continues, what we don't find in Genesis is the beginning of the combat myth though fragments of that are elsewhere in the Bible. Fair enough, that's right. There is no trace of the combat story or combat myth in Genesis 1, which is the object of discussion here, right? Not whether or not in other poetic portions of the Old Testament you might find reference to this sort of combat uh, myth. He says, given the obvious parallels, the earlier Babylonian story must be in the lineage of the Genesis story somewhere, but not every story element made it. And that is a conclusion which contemporary scholarship has come to reject. When these early stories were first discovered back around 1870s or so, uh, 
there arose a school within Old Testament scholarship called Pan-Babylonianism, where scholars thought that everything uh, in Genesis was derived from these ancient Babylonian myths. And heroic attempts were made to trace the Genesis stories back to these uh, Babylonian uh, accounts. And during the course of the 20th century, Kevin, uh, scholarship has completely reversed on this issue. And these um, accounts, uh, particularly the Enuma Elish, are no longer thought to be sources for Genesis. That doesn't mean that they're completely unrelated. I think that these ancient myths tell us something about the literary genre of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Like these ancient myths, Genesis treats the same themes, creation of the world, creation of humanity, um, the flood, uh, things of that sort, uh, so that there is a common interest, but there is not uh, borrowing from these ancient myths uh, by and large. The, it, it would be um, very difficult to show any kind of uh, demonstrable borrowing uh, on the part of Genesis 1 from these ancient myths, with perhaps the exception of certain elements of the flood story, uh, which do seem to be similar. Um, but for the most part, contemporary scholarship has come to reject the thesis that Bob is expressing mm -hmm. here. Bill, th this search for parallels that we're always mm -hmm. hearing about always seems to be a dead end. Maybe that's just not a, uh, maybe that's just a, a dead end study. Uh, I think you're right, Kevin. It, it, it didn't pan out in New Testament studies. Mm -hmm. And now in Old Testament studies, it's not panning out either. The difficulties facing the attempt to base a genealogical relationship between separate accounts upon mere parallels is just fraught with difficulty. Uh, in the first place, you can't just compare isolated elements like, oh, there's water in mm -hmm. the Babylonia account and there's water in Genesis because you're just cherry picking then, mm -hmm. pulling things out of context. You've got to compare whole passages, whole narratives if the parallels are to be significant. And then the parallels need to be accurate rather than misunderstood. And I think a great example of this would be the misunderstanding of the primordial condition of the earth in Genesis 1 as chaos. It is not chaos in the proper sense of the term. This is an orderly, familiar state uh, of a kind of primeval ocean that will eventually drain into the seas and the rivers and the lakes and so forth. Finally, you would need to show some sort of uh, genealogical connection, uh, an influence or borrowing um, from the earlier source onto the later source, and that's very difficult. One difficulty is we don't know how old these traditions are behind Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of when the Pentateuch eventually came to be written down, we have no idea of how old these oral traditions are. And so the, the, the um, task of trying to show from parallels these sorts of genealogical connections is just fraught with difficulty and uncertainty, oh, and I, I think we can repose yeah. no confidence in these conclusions. I think so, yeah. And you have to imp It involves a lot of imposing yeah. a pattern and so forth. Bill, as we wrap up today... Um, even in the event that uh, there's no one go-to verse about God created from nothing, and you said that uh, there's not, that what we do is we take a full-orbed look at, at uh, the Scriptures to do that. But would it also be what you would often say as uh, kind of filling in the philosophical blanks a little bit to arrive at God creating from, from nothing? No, I, I don't think so, Kevin. I think that this is a doctrine that is implied or affirmed by the biblical authors themselves, oh, okay. um, especially John 1, 3. 
all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. The idea that there was a primordial, uncreated matter or stuff existing co-eternally alongside of God uh, is excluded by the author of John's Gospel, and I think also by the author of Genesis 1. Okay, and so you have a double warrant then, because you can also philosophically look and see what the, the, the case is. And, well, that, and that is the burden of the Kalam cosmological <laughs> argument, isn't it? Yes, it is. The second premise of which is the universe began to exist. And I've argued that we have both good philosophical reasons as well as powerful scientific evidence that the universe is not past eternal but had a beginning, just as Genesis says. Mm-hmm.